Hey everybody, welcome once again to the Winning Digital Customers Livecast. I'm Howard Tierski. Today, we're gonna to talk about a topic that it seems like everybody is talking about now, what the news media has dubbed the Great Resignation. We have had a substantial uptick in the number of people who have said, take this job and shove it over the last number of months. And I'm gonna share with you some statistics some of the reasons why I believe we're seeing this great resignation based on my work with dozens of companies, and what are the three things that I think you as a business, as an executive, can and should be doing about this new trend, the great resignation. So first of all, let's start with some statistics. What are we talking about? What has caused this trigger of everyone saying, claiming we have this thing called the great resignation? Well. The data really started to come in from April. So this is a relatively new thing over the last few months. 2.7% of all employed Americans, United States that is to say, quit their jobs in April of 2021. And this was a significant uptick in the percentage of people who normally quit their jobs. Now, one of the numbers you might've heard is a uh, concern about companies losing 30% of their employees. Uh, and that number comes from simply annualizing the April 2021 number. If you annualize, if we lost 2.7% of all our employees in April, uh, which by the way, my company didn't, a lot of companies didn't, so this isn't necessarily true across all companies, but the US Department of Labor Statistics, which aggregate across all companies, I think they exclude farm workers because that tends to be highly seasonal. But for the best of my knowledge, all other industries put together, we're talking about a uh, annualized number of 32.4% if it were annualized. Now, whether it will be annualized is another matter, but so that's where that number comes from, the risk. If every company lost a third of their employees this over the course of this year, clearly that would be a very significant impact. And so that's created a lot of consternation and concern. And in fact, in the months following April, April, May, June, July, August, in those months, the workforce lost 20 million people to quitting people who quit their jobs. So that is an annualized, uh, that is not annualized, but this is a, a continuing trend that April wasn't just uh, an anomaly, but we continued to see very significant numbers of people quitting their jobs over the course of that period of time. Just in August, which is the most recent month for which the US Department of Labor has re released statistics, uh, 4.3 million people quit their jobs. So we are seeing, no doubt, it's not a, it's not a rumor, it's not hype, uh, well, or there may be some hype, but there definitely is a trend towards this increase in the number of people quitting their jobs. And um, another way of looking at it, uh, well, and a couple of more details, because it's not consistent across every industry or every age gap or every age group, I should say. Um, first of all, interesting to note that the age group that is seeing the greatest number of resignations or the greatest uptick in resignations is the 30 to 45 year old age group. I think there's a, a common assumption out there. I've heard a lot of people articulate that this is mostly uh, the, the, the sort of bottom of the workforce, uh, teens and people in their early 20s. Uh, and in fact, while that is happening in that age gap, age group, according to a study by the Harvard Business Review, the greatest degree of this quitting of jobs is happening in the 30 to 45 year old age group. And it's also not completely consistent across industries. For example, in financial services, we are not seeing an increase in the number of resignations. But in the technology sector and in the healthcare sectors, for example, we're seeing very substantial upt upticks and in other sectors as well. So I don't have the full data on this and the numbers are still coming in, but we are definitely seeing some disparity across industries. And here's another study that was done uh, that said that 55% I think they, they surveyed something like 5,000 people who are currently employed, and 55% of people said that they are likely to look for a new job in the next 12 months. That's a pretty high percentage of people. Now, of course, of the 55% of people that say they're likely to look for a new job, it doesn't mean they'll all find a new job, that they'll all find a new job that they want, that they'll necessarily leave their current job. But nevertheless, that's a pretty high percentage of people, and it does kind of align with the possibility that could we see if 55% of people look for a new job, could 30% of people wind up leaving and taking a new job? Certainly not um, out of the realm of possibility. So uh, the great resignation uh, is real. And let's talk a little bit about 
why is this happening? Now, I want to caveat this. The, the last couple of um, topics I talked about are stats I was sharing with you. Those are sourced. That's from the U.S. Department of Labor, the Harvard Business Review, and other uh, groups doing research on this topic. <coughs> Pardon me. What I'm going to share with you now is my own observations in my work as a consultant. Uh, I work with executives across lots and lots of different companies. I talk to people from many, many more companies than even those that are our clients. Uh, and I know a lot of people at different levels of, of the labor force. So um, I have sources of information, but this is not scientific. This is based on my sampling, the perhaps few dozen companies that I've been in contact with over the last over the course of the last couple months around this topic of the Great Resignation. So I do believe this is pretty good data and information, but just wanted to give you that caveat. So in terms of looking at why this is happening, why are we seeing this uptick in people resigning their positions? I think there's two big categories. I'm calling them push versus pull. What is causing people to want to leave their existing positions? And what is attractive about some of the other positions that they're going to? Because, you know, let's face it, some people leave a job because they're like, I can't take this job anymore. I'm out of here. You know, the classic take this job and shove it moment. And other people say, well, I wasn't going to leave, but an opportunity came along and I'm sort of pulled to that opportunity. And of course, for some people, it's a little bit of a combination. Another opportunity comes along. They're already not super happy where they are. And so they choose to leave. So in any case, I think we have these two categories and I'm going to talk about them sort of separately. So first, let's talk about push. What are the reasons why people are saying, you know what, I really want to quit my job? So I'm going to give you five or six reasons. The first that we keep hearing about is COVID burnout. And this is especially true in industries that have seen a huge surge in demand due to COVID or a massive disruption due to COVID. So for example, healthcare, of course. Healthcare workers have been working crazy hours. They've been dealing with all kinds of trauma and uh, death. And so, of course, this has been very, very stressful. It's gone on for an extended period of time. It's, but it's not just healthcare, education as well. America's teachers are really burned out with all that's been asked of them to transform the way that they do their jobs, to deal with uh, you know, remote learning. And now, even with kids back in the classroom, by, by and large, we're seeing still waves of COVID cases. So all of a sudden, half the kids in their classroom might be out, and then they've got to deal with catching the kids up. So uh, there's been a lot of additional pressure in education. And then you can also point to, like I mentioned, the tech sector. Certain areas of the tech sector, we've seen huge increases in demand, whether it's e-commerce or platform companies like Zoom, Instacart. And while that's great for their business, it can be hell on their people, right? If all of a sudden they're trying to deal with this huge surge in demand. So that's reason number one. And it's not applicable in every business or in every industry, but in certainly in certain businesses and industries, people are suffering with COVID burnout and they just can't take it anymore. That's reason number one. Reason number two is that the labor shortage is a kind of a, uh, uh, it's kind of a, a, a negative cycle, meaning the more short staffed you are at a particular company, very often the harder the remaining people have to work to make up for the fact that you're short, so short staffed. And that creates a, um, that creates a, a more negative work experience very often. And furthermore, when a comp like, let's say it's a restaurant or a car rental agency or, or what have you, right? A hotel. When you're that short staffed, not only are you working harder because you don't have the number of, of colleagues you're supposed to have, but the customers are very often less happy because of course your level of customer service is not what it normally is. So if you're on the wait staff of a, of, of a restaurant, you're trying your best to serve customers, taking more tables than you normally would because you don't have enough other people to do the job with you. And yet your customers are bitterly complaining that their food is cold and it's not coming fast enough. This is not a rewarding situation. <laughs> so this, this um, sort of negative spiral of already being short staffed, causing the people who are left to have a negative work experience and then potentially want to leave themselves, of course, further exacerbating the problem of being short staffed is uh, a second uh, significant reason why we're seeing people feeling pushed out of their existing um, positions. Um, a third reason, office return. So not so much for restaurants, but for people who work in offices. And by the way, you'll note that not all of these reasons are applicable to everybody in every type of job in every situation. So there's a handful of reasons that people are being pushed, feeling pushed out. And 
for some people, it might be one or two or three of them that apply to them. For any given person, some of these aren't going to apply. But another one of the factors, another one of the forces that's driving resignation is a lot of people had the opportunity to work from home over the last, whatever it's been now, year and a half, and a lot of them grew to like it. Of course, there are upsides and downsides of remote work, but you, of course, you don't have to commute, you don't have to do your dry cleaning, you can be home from your, for your kids when they come home from school, uh, you know, you can make a snack in your own kitchen. Obviously, there are a lot of reasons why there's convenience for workers when they're doing their jobs from home. And some companies have started to say, okay, everyone's vaccinated, uh, you know, the, the, the pandemic is dying down, we want everyone back in the office. And some people are saying, no. <laughs> I've heard a lot of people say after working remotely, they're never going back. They quote, never want to go back to working a five day a week in the office schedule. Um, uh, by the way, one study by PwC showed that 12% of employees, 12% of the entire workforce have now moved during COVID more than 50 miles from their office location. Meaning that during COVID, they said, oh, well, since I don't have to be in the office, I can move out to the country. I can move maybe to Florida or someplace where the weather's nicer or property values are less or whatever. And now they're quite a distance from the office they worked at. And of course, when someone says you need to come back, now they're talking about a much longer commute and or even an impossible commute. And so that's one of the things that's leading people to say, nope, I've already moved. If you really want me back in the office, then you know I'm sorry, but I'm not going to be able to continue to do this job. Um, another study by the, uh, the uh, August Job Seeker Survey asked job seekers in the marketplace today, what is most important to them in looking for a new job? And 47% uh, put job security high on the list. 53% put higher pay on the list, which makes sense. But 56% higher than either of those put workplace flexibility. So more than ever before, employees are looking for and, uh, are, and, and, and valuing works, workplace flexibility, meaning that they can work from home when they want and need to. And while some companies have moved forward from the COVID world and said, wow, we learned an amazing lesson during COVID. Our, our people can work remotely very effectively. We can save tons of money on office leases. Let's, let's not renew our leases or let's re renew only half of our leases and, and save money on office space. Other companies are saying, no, 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 we believe people should be in the office. We believe they're more productive, whether they're right or they're wrong. And they're trying to force their employees back to the office. So especially for those that are trying to force their employees back to the office, and I see this firsthand, people are leaving left and right. So that's the matter of office return. Um, next is the fact that, you know, a lot of employees just weren't that satisfied in the first place. I mean, of course, it's not a new thing now that employees quit their jobs. People, employees have always been quitting their jobs. It's just elevated. But of course, one of the things that uh, triggers employees to leave is they just don't like their jobs. They don't like their job. They don't like their boss. They don't like the culture. There's something about their position that they're dissatisfied with. You know, there was a, there was a study a couple of years ago, many of you probably saw it by the Gallup organization, and they looked to see how many employees were engaged with their jobs. You know, that was a job they really cared about, they were interested in, they were excited about. And they concluded in the Gallup study that only 20% of the global workforce feels truly engaged in their job. 80% are, you know, they don't care that much about their job. It's just, you know, a job. So right there, that tells you a lot. I mean, that's to me, that's a fairly shocking statistic that the number of people that are really engaged in the work that they do is so low. So you have this sort of pre-existing baseline of perhaps lower than optimal levels of employee satisfaction. And then when you layer on some of these other issues, they combine together. Um, I would add kind of related, but a little different is the issue of corporate cynicism. You know, back in the what, 40s, 50s, 1940s, 1950s, I mean, there was this mindset, oh, you get a job at a big company, they're gonna take care of you for life, they're gonna give you great health care. they're gonna give you a pension, you know, you're going to be kind of have lifelong employment as long as you do a good job, as long as you're committed to them, they're going to be committed to you. Well, I think we've seen since then with all the ups and the downs in the economy and the, and the layoffs that most people today, and I have no data to support this, although I'm guessing it's out there, but I certainly see it every day. They have a very transactional mindset about the companies they work for. Not everybody, but a lot. They figure, you know, this company's only going to keep me around as long as they want me and need me, and if something changes and I'm not, you know, I'm no longer economically desirable, they're going to dump me. They're going to move my uh, my job to India, or they're going to automate my job, or what have you. 
So they're going to hire someone younger and cheaper into my job, and they're going to kick me to the curb when they no longer want me. And so there's this cynicism about corporations. And I think that that, again, isn't new, but was part of the underlying um, dissatisfaction that then when you layer it on top of some of the other men I items I mentioned, I think add to the, 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 the stew <laughs> that's leading people to say, take this job and shove it. A couple more on the push side, and then we'll to pull. Um, I think, you know, reduced perks. And of course, over the years, employee benefits have in many cases been being reduced. There are exceptions, of course. Google, you know, famously uh, giving everyone, uh, you know, gourmet catered lunches. But I also think that when less employees are in the office, some of the perks that come with having a, a corporate job, for example, are also reduced. Now, I mentioned earlier how employees prefer, like a lot of employees want to be able to work more from home and companies are trying to push them back into the office. But also when you're not in the office as much, there are certain, I mean, there are certain benefits that you get by working for a big company, like a nice office, right? And you know what? I mean, it's a beautiful building downtown. And if I do really well, I can wind up getting the corner office with an amazing view that's going to make me feel important and make me look important to other people. This idea of the office as part of the perk, if you will, of working for a big company obviously is demolished when uh, companies are no longer asking their employees to come to the office. And on the one hand, that may be what employees want. But on the other hand, and as we're going to talk about on the pull side, if they're going to sit in their own house and work, there's a lot of jobs that they could have where they might have more control. The benefit of working for a big corporation from your home is less. So I think you have, just by very nature of the changing nature of work, uh, a reduction in the benefits of working for a big company. Okay, so those are some of the things that are pushing people out the door. Again, not everybody is affected by all of those things. I wonder how many you're affected by. How many of these things are, are points of dissatisfaction or reasons why if you were to resign your position, they would be a contributing factor. But let's look at the pull side because it's not just that people are not happy where they are, but people see greener pastures. So what are the things that are pulling people to leave their jobs? Because most of the people who are leaving their jobs are not leaving to become unemployed. That was true uh, during the height of COVID when the unemployment benefits were extended. And I think there were people who felt that, well, it wasn't so much, you know, if you quit your job, you don't get unemployment, right? But I think there were people who were laid off, for example, because of COVID and then weren't enthusiastic about going back to work because the unemployment benefits were pretty good, especially people at the lower end of the pay scale. But of course, those, most of those benefits have sunset now and we're back to a more normal unemployment situation. Um, and certainly people who quit their jobs aren't eligible for unemployment anyway, at least not here in the United States. So what are the things that are pulling people to some other kind of work model away from these uh, existing jobs around which they may have some dissatisfaction? Well, the first is it's a very tight labor market. And so there's great opportunities out there because so many companies have become so desperate for employees it is a seller's market, so to speak, if you're an employee. And so naturally, uh, when there's more opportunities, companies are, when there's less demand, supply in the market, uh, companies that need to hire are offering to pay more, they're offering better be benefits, they're offering better perks, they're recruiting more aggressively. And so naturally, when there's more opportunities out there, you're going to see more people leaving for those great opportunities. It's the opposite of what happens during a downturn. When unemployment is high, People don't really want to leave their job because it's going to be so tough to find another job. When unemployment is low, the labor market is tight, naturally. people It's much easier for someone to say, I can go out right now and find another job. The next, which expands upon that, is remote opportunities. Because more and more companies are taking the mindset that they've learned from COVID that remote employees can be extremely productive. And so while in the past, many employees many employers rather, took the mindset that, you know, I need to either hire from my local market. If I run a business in Des Moines, Iowa, I need to either hire people who are in Des Moines, or if I'm going to hire someone from another part of the country, I've got to pay to relocate them to the Des Moines area. And I've got to find somebody who's willing to relocate. Because let's face it, a lot of people don't want to relocate. They like where they live. They have their friends. Maybe they have kids in school. It's hard to find somebody who's willing to relocate especially if you're trying to relocate someone to a market that may not be ideal for many people. It's one thing if you're trying to get people to relocate to San Francisco or New York, but to try to convince someone to relocate to somewhere in the Midwest that might not be the most exciting place in the world, nothing against Des Moines, lovely town, um, that can be challenging. When all of a sudden, um, 
so many companies have a mindset that says, oh, no, you know, you can stay where you are. If you live in San Francisco or New York or, or, or Austin or some other hip place, I want you to work for my company in Des Moines, but you can live still live in Austin, you know, or wherever you want to be. You can just connect to us by Zoom, maybe come visit us once a quarter in our locations in Des Moines, but otherwise continue living your life where you are. Well, that means that for anyone who's thinking about leaving their current job, instead of being limited to the local geography, they have a you know infinitely greater range of possibilities of jobs that they can go look for. So all of a sudden, you know, if you're a chief marketing officer at one of the bigger companies, we'll stick with Des Moines, not to pick on poor Des Moines, and you'd like, you know, let's say you work your chief marketing officer at one of the biggest financial services companies in Des Moines. Well, how many are there? It's a handful. So if there's not another chief marketing officer job at another one of those handful of companies, and you want to leave, well, where are you going to go? But on the other hand, if the whole country is open to you at any one point in time, no doubt there are some, some exciting jobs open. So that has really changed the dynamic for the you know, number of options that someone can go look at. So that's remote opportunities. Here's another thing that's pulling people. It's what I've heard called the COVID midlife crisis. Very simply, during COVID, when people were, were stuck at home, they had more time on their hands things that would normally be distractions like going out, hanging out with friends, things like that were taken away. And so people had more time to reflect. And sometimes that led people to think, you know, COVID aside, am I really doing what I want to with my life? Am I on the right track? Or do I want to make some sort of change? You know, do I want to quit the corporate world and finally open that pottery shop I wanted to open or that scuba diving school or, you know, become a yoga instructor or an executive coach or, you know, stop working for a big company as an accountant and start my own accounting practice or whatever it may be. So you just have a percentage of people who use that time to think about their lives. And a conclusion of that was, I want to make a change. So that's another factor that's sort of pulling people to do something different. A few more. The gig economy. So today, most people are aware that, you know, if they really need to make a few bucks, they can sign up to be an Uber driver or an Instacart person, or any one of another number of gig economy jobs. I can go on Upwork if I'm a designer or an accountant or somebody else like that and say, hey, I'm available. You know, you can hire me to design your logo, to build your website, to do your bookkeeping, whatever skill you have. And it's so much easier due to the digital world that we live in for someone to hang out a shingle and start to earn money. Therefore, this, the fear, the risk that, oh, if I leave my job, if I quit, you know, how will I ever earn a living? Well, first of all, for some people, if you're in a lower paid job, if you're working for, you know, let's say a fast food franchise, the idea that you could actually leave your job and maybe make more money, but not just make more money, but be your own boss, you know, work your own hours, work when you feel like it, don't work when you don't want to. But that's the nature of being an Uber driver, right? It's potentially... A, a, a lifestyle that gives you more freedom. And if you can have more freedom and still make a decent living, then for people at the lower end of the pay scale, the gig economy offers a compelling alternative. And of course, there's tons of opportunity there. And if you're higher up in the economic market, if you're saying, well, you know, if I became an Uber driver, I wouldn't make nearly as much money as I'm making as a you know, mid-level accountant at some like large accounting firm, but you want to say open your own accounting practice, you also know that even though it might not be as much money, if you needed to supplement your income, if you wanted to get your own thing going and you needed to supplement your income, you could grab one of these jobs. You could be an Uber driver, Lyft driver, whatever else, and not starve. And if you need to do that on a temporary basis, it reduces the risk of starting your own thing. And then of course, as I say, you can use all the assets of the gig economy, all the digital tools to find to find customers. And it's just so much easier to start your own thing these days. And so I think that whole idea of the gig economy is one of the things that's pulling people out of jobs to say, I don't need a job, I can be my own boss. And that of course sounds appealing to many people. A similar but slight variation on that is the idea of opening an online business, becoming an eBay merchant or someone who's on, you know, an, an Amazon seller, someone who buys stuff off of uh, Alibaba, you know, you buy a thousand units of something for $3 and then you list them and you import them into the country and you list them on Amazon for $12 and you try to make money that way. There are many different forms of online businesses that people can start. And again, that's becoming easier than ever, whether that's a, a service you want to sell or you can make something, for example, on Etsy, make your, make your own furniture or your paint paintings or whatever else. 
photography and make a living selling that, which clearly tens and tens of thousands of people are doing, or simply become a merchant. It's just so much easier to open your own store. So those are, again, uh, you know, opportunities for someone to say, I don't even need a job. It's not even about finding a better job. I don't even need a job. I can start my own thing. Uh, another uh, poll that kind of falls into a similar category is the influencer aspiration. You know, when I was a kid, if you ask kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? People would say, kids would say, oh, I want to be a fireman or I want to be a ballerina or a police officer or maybe a lawyer or a doctor. When they ask kids today, I know there have been some studies on this. I don't have any stats to show you today, but the number one answer they get from kids today is, I want to be a YouTuber. It seems like everybody today wants to be a YouTube influencer. And while clearly we can't all be YouTube influencers, this is another form of, I guess you could call it an online business, saying I'm going to travel the world and post my, my adventures on YouTube, or I'm going to know about shoes or makeup or fashion or hairstyle or whatever it is, post videos on YouTube, and I'm going to make money that way. And there is a real you know, career doing that. You don't have to become the world's most famous YouTuber to find a market of people who are listening to you and be able to make money doing that. So this is another um, uh, area where many people now are realizing that they have an alternative to a traditional job. Um, you know, and lastly, in my little list here of things that are the pull, it's Shark Tank as the new American dream. <laughs> Not necessarily specifically going on Shark Tank, but the idea that if you have an idea for a product that you want to launch or a service that, you know, you can use the digital world to find someone who can manufacture it for you in China, to set up a store on a service like Square that can take payments, to use tools like Instagram or Facebook to market it, that, that you don't need to go find, you don't need to pitch your idea to a big company. You don't need to work for a big company. If you want an idea for a new product, a new fashion concept or whatever, all the kind of stuff they show on Shark Tank, that there are ways, even without getting funding from the sharks, to create a business around that. And these are just more examples of just like being an influencer, or being an eBay seller or what have you, being on Upwork, all the ways that people have this alternative to a traditional job. And for many people, when they get to a certain point in their life, they say, you know what, I'd like to try an alternative. And you know, I think that what this really means, and I, I see this as part of a trend, which is a kind of a power to the people trend. One of the things we saw in the first couple decades of the digital revolution is that consumers had more power than ever before. It used to be that if you were a consumer, if I wanted to go buy a wrench, well, where could I buy a wrench? Assuming I didn't want to order it from a catalog and wait three months for it to arrive, you know, I had to kind of go to the hardware store in my town. And if there was only one hardware store, that's where I had to buy the wrench. And if there were you know, two hardware stores, then okay, I had a little bit of selection unless I wanted to drive 40 minutes to another town and then maybe I'd have one more selection, you know, but you didn't have that many choices for where you wanted to buy something. You were limited to what they stocked and you were kind of stuck with the prices that they charged. And of course, with Amazon and the internet and eBay and all these places that people can buy things online, now I have an infinite number of choices about where to buy a wrench. And in many cases, Amazon will get it to me the next day or even same day, et cetera. So the internet created so much more power for the consumer and, and retailers, for example, had to bend to that and had to, had to woo customers in a new way. And I think we're now seeing the same thing with employment, that even though you could buy stuff on Amazon t five years ago, you kind of still had to get in your car and go to your job, right? You couldn't get a digital job the way that you could buy things from the digital world, at least for most people they didn't. And what we've seen accelerate through COVID is the fact that now you can. And so um, one of the things that, especially here in the United States, is perhaps the most powerful motivator for many people is the idea of freedom. Americans love freedom. And we see this all the time in our politics, you know, uh, even the question of, you know, is it, is it a freeing to be, if everyone has a COVID vaccine, does that make us all more free? Or is it actually less free because we're being, you know, forced to take a COVID vaccine or forced to wear masks or whatever it may be. And you know, my goal is not to uh, wade into a political issue there, but just to say that this is very often the driving force behind things that people in this country get emotional about is what will make me more free. And I think historically, the idea of having a job was that it was freeing. If you had a job, you knew you had money coming in, you don't have to worry about paying the bills, you could take a vacation, it, they, they took care of your health care. Having a job gave you freedoms, albeit in exchange for losing some freedoms, like you couldn't sleep all day. But increasingly, I think what people are realizing is that there are other paths and having a job may give you freedoms of some sorts, but take others away. And there are other ways to get freedom and still be able to pay your bills, et cetera. And so I think that's a lot of a theme that cuts across a lot of what I've been talking about.
Okay, so we need to round this up pretty quickly. I want to point out one more point here, and then I want to talk about what can you do about it? What are the tactics as a company, a business, should be doing to deal with this business problem of the great resignation? But I first just want to point this out. While we have seen a huge uptick in, in quitting and resignations over the last few months, it is actually part of a long trend. This graph is from the US Department of Labor and it shows resignations. And you can see, look from 2010 through 2020, you can see that over the last 10 years, this is the percentage of people in the workforce that are quitting their jobs, I think quarterly. This might be shown quarterly or monthly. And ignore for a minute the little ups and downs, right? Just kind of consider what the overall trend is. The overall trend has been a steady increase in the number of people quitting their jobs from 2010, you know, after we ended the kind of great recession, right? All the way through to the beginning of the pandemic to early 2020. And then of course you saw a huge decline in the number of people quitting their jobs because for one thing, no one was hiring, right? In the very beginning of the pandemic, everyone was freaking out. There was no way to get another job. And um, well, frankly, a lot of companies were laying people off. So this isn't showing layoffs. This isn't showing people fired, just quitting. There was no need to quit. And of course, a lot of people were worried about the future. So you had a huge temporary decline in the number of people that are quitting their jobs. But then it, it, it goes back just where it was. And then, of course, since we've seen a huge uptick. Point being, though, a lot of the trends that I'm talking about here are not exclusively about COVID, of course. And this recent increase is just a, an acceleration of a trend that we've been seeing for a long time. And you could argue that that's consistent with a lot of the things we see with COVID. A lot of what we've seen with COVID is accelerating trends that we already saw around adoption of digital and other things. Okay. So what to do about it? I think there are three main things that companies can do about it. The first, sort of obvious, is reduce resignations. If you're at risk of 30% of your workforce leaving over the next year, I think there are about six key things you can do to try to reduce resignations. Number one, appreciation. Show your employees that they're appreciated, that you care. And not just from the company, try to let them see the appreciation of customers especially in a world where we're seeing a lot of customer anger at companies that are not delivering uh, the, the level of customer service that they normally do because of the labor shortage. There are obviously other situations where customers are very happy. Try to figure out how you can pour as much appreciation at your employees as you can. Number two, compensation. There's no question that if you want to retain employees, paying them more or improving their benefits or doing other things is a strategy that certainly can work at cost. Of course, there's substantial cost in doing that, but there's also substantial cost in having to replace employees. And there's also substantial cost if you don't have enough people to run your business. So I think in a tight labor market, companies may look to be need to be looking to pay their employees more. Uh, third is culture, looking at how enjoyable is it to work for your company and has the culture declined since more people are working remotely? If so, what can you do to improve the culture? We did a whole, uh, uh, did a whole live cast on the topic of culture. We can include a link to that in the notes if we remember, <laughs> um, or just seek it out. Um, in any case, um, that's certainly uh, an area. Third, fourth is perks. What else can you do to, again, sort of improve the overall value proposition of employees working for your company? Fifth, but perhaps it should be first, is flexibility. Make sure employees are not leaving you because of the flexibility that they can get at other companies or in the gig economy, you may need to offer that flexibility yourself. Even if you'd like all your employees back in the office, it might sound like a nice idea, but if, they, if you start to lose huge percentages of them, it just may not be worth it. And lastly is growth. Help employees understand that there is a path to growth. And this is something that corporations have historically been good at, but depending on the person, depending on the role, they may or may not see the opportunities to grow in that role in a way that makes sense to, for them to be willing to invest in the long term. So those are six real quick ways to try to reduce resignation. Of course, one could spend a whole live cast just on this topic, but I want to go to the other two reasons because I, the other two things you can do because reducing resignations is certainly worthwhile, but it's not the only way to deal with the great resignation. The next is digitization. We are already looking at a, a trend where many companies are finding ways to automate or provide more customer self-service, such as at McDonald's, where now if you want to order a Big Mac, you can stand in line and tell the, um, the, you know, the, the person working at the counter. You can also order on your mobile phone. You could also order from a kiosk. Finding ways to allow fewer people to do more work, whether that's in the back office or whether it's at the front office, has been an ongoing trend for some time. And if you are finding yourself in a huge labor shortage, like so many companies, it may be a time to accelerate that process. Because, you know, it's always a drag to have to do layoffs. If a company employs 
for various methods of automation. And all of a sudden, they have unnecessarily unnecessary employees. Some employees are redundant. Laying people off is expensive. You have to usually give them severance. And furthermore, um, it's bad for morale. If all of a sudden employees have left on their own and you are short-staffed, it could be an excellent opportunity to employ more digitization to automate things such that you can actually have that same number of employees run the operations, not by taking it on their backs for one person to do the job of three people, but by making their jobs easier and thereby actually saving yourself money in the long run, running a more efficient business and not needing to replace all those people that have left. So that's digitization. Again, that alone could be a whole life cast, of course. And lastly would be look for new models. If you need human labor, Look at what some of these companies in the gig economy are doing, whether it's eBay, which you know creates sort of independent opportunities for people to sell. Traditional stores hire merchandisers to figure out what to put in their store. eBay just lets anyone list their stuff. Uber and Lyft, of course, don't hire their drivers as employees. They create an opportunity for anyone with a car and some time to use their platform to go find people who are going to pay them uh, to drive them around. And so I think that big companies can be thinking about what they can learn from the gig economy. If you're running a, a, you know, a large retail chain or you're running a, uh, you know, a, a, a fast food type operation, maybe you need to move to a model where instead of every employee having to take a certain number of shifts and being assigned by the boss, and people can sign up online, do some online training, and then be able to take on certain jobs by simply signing up for a shift and showing up. And if they want to move up in the organization, they can do more training online and prove themselves of, capable of doing more jobs. And just like many drivers are both Uber drivers and Lyft drivers, and on any given day, they or even any given hour, they go with whichever company is willing to pay them more. I could imagine a future in which the same person has been sort of qualified to work at Target and Starbucks and Taco Bell. And if they feel like working today, they look to see who's got shifts available and how much they're paying today. Because you just like Uber drivers get paid bonuses if there's a period of time when there's more demand than there is supply, there's more people who want rides, Uber starts to offer drivers more money in order to get off their couch and get in their car and start driving those people around. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of complexities in implementing something like that, but I think that big companies maybe need to start to learn something from those companies playing in the gig economy. They may be able to replace those people with people who want to, if people want to live a more free gig economy type lifestyle, there may still be a way for those big companies to get their help, to get their labor without needing to employ them in a traditional method. And that doesn't even necessarily mean whether they're being paid as a 1099 or as a W-2, whether taxes are being withheld. That's to me, that's the minutia. It's more the big picture of what's the nature of the employment relationship. And maybe more and more people want to feel more independent these days. And maybe companies can be just as successful with fewer traditional employees and more people supporting their enterprise using alternative models. So those are the three ways we've covered a lot in the last 35 minutes. Uh, what is the great resignation? What are the push factors that are pushing people out of companies? What are the pull factors that are pulling people into other opportunities? The three things you can do about it, ways to reduce resignation, ways to um, uh, uh, digitize so that you don't need as many people, and some new employment models to get labor in ways that aren't necessarily traditional employment. Hopefully all that has been useful. I know we crammed a lot into this session. Um, but uh, thank you, as always, for, for listening and for watching the Winning Digital Customers podcast. I look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, keep transforming.